Alhamdulillah, <laughs> يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم نقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters in Islam The first house of worship that was built on this planet, the first house that was built for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the Kaaba in Mecca, as Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, in the Awwal Baytin, Wudi'a lil nasi la ladi bi Bakka, Mubarakan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this house. That the first house that was built for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for mankind was the one in Bakka, which is another name for Mecca. And that house was built by two great prophets of Allah. Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhim as-salam wa id yarfa'u Ibrahim al-qawa'id min al-bayt wa Ismail Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta as-sami'u al-alim When Ibrahim raised the house he raised the foundations of the house him and Ismail saying Rabbana taqabbal minna Oh Allah accept it from us They didn't just assume that because they were doing a good deed, that it was going to be accepted from them. They asked Allah to accept it from them. Indeed, 
you are the one who hears everything and you are the knower of all things, subhanahu wa ta'ala. As time went on, the pagans of Quraysh, the tribe that our Prophet sallallahu is from, they inherited the responsibility of maintaining the Kaaba. So they took care of its physical structure. They cleaned the Kaaba. They made sure that everything was intact around that area. Except that they also littered the Kaaba with idols. And so Allah Azza wa Jal, after sending his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spread, Allah Azza wa Jal said that it is no longer appropriate. مَا كَانَ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ أَنْ يَعْمُرُوا مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ شَاهِدِينَ عَلَىٰ أَنْفُسِهِمْ بِالْكُفْرِ That it is not right for the mushrikeen to maintain the houses of Allah while they witness for themselves disbelief. They bear witness that they are kufar. So it's not appropriate for them to maintain the house that should have been erected and that was erected for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And then as the deen of Islam spread and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went back to Mecca and conquered Mecca with no bloodshed, Allah azza wa jal revealed to the Muslims <coughs> that it is their responsibility to care for the house of Allah. إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَ الزَّكَاةِ وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah Azza wa Jal said that the عِمَارَ إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ that the houses of Allah are only يَعْمُر and I'll talk about that in a second. They are only maintained by those who believe in Allah in the last day. And they establish the salah, and they give the zakat, and they only fear Allah. <coughs> they don't fear anything else. They don't fear people, they don't feel po fear poverty, they feel, fear none of that. They establish and they maintain the houses of Allah. What does it mean that they maintain the houses of Allah. Because most of us think that it means simply to build the house of Allah. There's two types of maintenance. You walk away with nothing from this khutbah at this point. Because it helps you to understand the book of Allah. إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ Allah. What does it mean that we maintain the houses of Allah? Two types of maintenance. There's a tangible maintenance. And there's an intangible maintenance of the house of Allah. Tangible meaning what? That you actually go build the house of Allah, that you put the carpet in the house of Allah. This is what the Mufassirin, the scholars of Tafsir, they mentioned. That you keep the house of Allah lit with lights when it needs to have lights. These heaters, air conditioners, and so forth, all of that is part of maintaining the house of Allah, making sure that it stays intact. And this is the responsibility of the believers. Not a mustahab, mandu, sunnah in that sense. I and mean, we have a choice, no, we don't have a choice. We, we, the Muslims, each and every single one of us, according to his capacity, his or her capacity, has the responsibility of maintaining the house of Allah in a tangible sense. And there's also the intangible maintenance of the house of Allah, meaning that you use the house of Allah, Azza wa Jal, for what it was established for. You establish the Salat, in the house of Allah. Not in your house, in the house of Allah. That the, that the salat is established. That the Quran is recited. That dua is being made. That lessons, Islamic teachings are being spread in the house of Allah. All of this is part of maintaining the house of Allah. If we have a beautiful structure and nobody prays in it, we have failed to maintain the house of Allah. And if the house of Allah that we go to, that we pray in, is falling down, or it's not being erected properly, and we're not renovating it properly, we're not doing things properly, then we have failed to maintain the house of Allah. I hope that we understand this point, because this is an obligation upon us. It's not something just recommended. We have a responsibility as Muslims. Allah Azawajal took the responsibility of maintaining the Kaaba away from Quraysh. Because, because 
they didn't actually maintain the house of Allah. They worshiped other than Allah. And this is an opportunity for us, those of us who are alive today, to take care and maintain the houses of Allah so that we can do in them what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us. These houses are the most beloved places to Allah. They're the most beloved places to Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَحَبُّ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ الْمَسَاجِدِ That the most beloved places on earth to Allah are the masajid. But, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa didn't stop there. He went on to say, وَأَبْغَضُ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَسْوَاقُهَا And the most detestable, the most hated places to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth are its aswaq, the souk, the marketplace. Everybody who's hearing this right now, ask yourself, what is your masjid to marketplace ratio? How much time do you spend in the masjid in a week? And how much time do you spend in the marketplace? How much time do you spend in the places that Allah Azza wa Jal said are the most beloved places to him? How much time do you spend in those places that Allah said are the most despicable and the most hated places to him? The scholars of hadith, they say that these houses are the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they have been established for his worship and his worship is being maintained in those houses. Whereas the aswan, the marketplace is usually a place where people cheat, they cheat each other, they lie, there's deception when there's competition, and at the very least, it's a place where oftentimes they're trying to feed off of the natural greed that we have as human beings. And so they put all types of advertisements out to try to get you to buy stuff that you don't need, and your heart now becomes attached to the temporal instead of being attached to al-hayy al-qayyum alladhi la yamut instead of being attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who does not die the living and so these houses are important for us to maintain they are important for us to be in our prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said in a very important hadith he says sab'atu yudhilluhum Allah fi dhilli he said that there are seven people who will be shaded in Allah's shade, shade from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day when there will be no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which he provides. Seven, however, there are seven people who will be shaded by Allah on that day when the sun is drawn so close that some people will perspire up to their ankles, others up to their hips, others up to their mouths. But some will be shaded. One category, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, A man whose heart is attached to the masjid. Notice here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi didn't say a man who was always in the masjid. Because a man has an obligation to go out of the masjid and provide for his family. A man has that obligation. But the Prophet Sallallahu said what? His heart is attached to the masjid. So when he leaves the masjid, his heart is still with the masjid. He wants to get back to the house of Allah. He wants to get back for prayer. He wants to hear the word of Allah. He wants to congregate with his brothers in Islam. Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allaqun bil masjid. His heart is attached to the masjid. And why the masjid? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever makes wudu in his home and then heads out to the masjid and he only intends by going to the masjid the salah. He's not going to the masjid because somebody owes him money and he's supposed to meet at the masjid. He's not going to the masjid because he wants to meet somebody and then they're going to go somewhere else together. He's going to the masjid solely to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make the salah. The Prophet said that for that person, his salah is increased bid'an wa ishreena marwah. 
Yani, in other words, 20 some odd times it is better for him than praying in his home. And in some narrations, the Prophet said 25 to 27 times the reward for praying in the masjid. The Prophet went on to say in this hadith, and for every step that that person takes, he has raised a degree and a sin is wiped away for going to the masjid. For every step that that person takes, a sin is erased. He's raised a degree. And the Prophet went on to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's not all. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on to say, and he is considered to be in Salat as long as he is waiting for the Salat. So if you came to prayer 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early, 20 minutes early, it's being written for you by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as if you are in prayer, as long as you're waiting for Salat. But that's not all. And the angels will pray for him saying, Allahumma khir, Allahumma arham, O oh Allah, forgive him, O oh Allah, have mercy on him, as long as he sits in his place of prayer, ma lam yuhdith, as long as he does not break his wudu. So even after your prayer, you're no longer waiting for salat, but you're sitting there and you're making dua, you're making dhikr. The angels continue to pray, but that's only in the house of Allah. That doesn't happen when you pray in your house. At least to the brothers. That doesn't happen. It happens when you go to the house of Allah. It doesn't happen when you pray in your base or in your soup, as the Prophet said. Not in your house and not in your marketplace. It happens in the masjid. So after the salat, as you're saying, subhanAllah, the angels are making dua for you. Now many of you, when somebody is going to the, to the Prophet's city, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or they're going to Mecca, you say, make dua for me, Akhi. Make dua for me, sister. Why don't you make dua for me? Oh, you're traveling. Make dua for me. I hear people say it all the time. Somebody wrote me a text this morning. Why don't you try to make dua for me? Yeah, he, that's a beautiful thing. We're going to make dua for each other, inshallah. But trust me, you'd rather have the angels make dua for you than any human being. And the angels will be praying for you. Allahumma khfir. Allahumma rham. Allahumma khfir lah. Allahumma rham. Oh, Allah, have mercy on him. Oh, Allah, forgive him. As long as you're sitting in the masjid, as long as you're sitting in the masjid, as long as you don't break your wudu. And so this is very, these are some of the things that our Prophet has taught us to highlight the importance of the masjid. But brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm not going to stop there. There are some other important things we need to mention. And one of them is that the Prophet gave preference to the masjid in terms of building it over his own home. The first thing that the Prophet Sallallahu did when he got to Medina, he stopped at Quba. He prayed there for 10 nights and then he got on his camel, Al Qaswan. And he went down into the city. Hatta Barakat. Until his camel kneeled down. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Insha'Allah, had al manzil. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Insha'Allah, this is the manzil. That is, this is the place where we are going to establish the masjid. It was a yard that they used to drive dates. It was owned by two young companions, Suhail and Sahan. They were under the, they were orphans. They were under the care of As'ad ibn Zurara. And so the Prophet Sallallahu tried to buy the yard from them and they said, no, we want to give it to you as a gift. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi refused except to pay for it. And he bought that yard and that's where they built what is now the Prophet's Masjid. He did that before he built his home. And many of us, we go to the Masajid, and the Masajid are asking us for help. We got 7,000, 8,000 set aside for cabinets. We want to remodel our homes. And we don't want to give anything to the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the house of Allah in this land, in a land where the majority, overwhelming majority of the people are Kufa. At best, Muslims make up about two to three percent of the population in this country. Let, let that sink in for me. That means that if you went out randomly, out of every hundred people you meet, 98 of them would be non Muslim. When you send your kids to public school, Chances are, 
their teachers are going to be non-Muslims, and the majority of their classmates are going to be non-Muslims. When you go to work, chances are the majority of the people who are with you at work are non-Muslims. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with a different situation, you should praise him much. But this is the reality. So the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this land has a different function or it plays a role that it may not play everywhere. And that is the preservation of Muslim identity. Which is why it is more important for us in this land to support the houses of Allah than it is probably in most other lands. And we have an opportunity to support the house of Allah. Wallahi Iqwan, some of you here are older, you experienced Islam in this city before many of us were Muslim or before many of us came here. These brothers sacrificed their time, they sacrificed their wealth, they sacrificed family relations, similar to, not on the same scale, that the companions did at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. They had to sacrifice. If they were tribal leaders and they accepted Islam and their tribes did it, they had to give that up. Some of them lost mothers and fathers and spouses because of the fact that they accepted Islam. Many of them lost their wealth. They had to make hijrah. They lost their homes. They lost, they had to leave all of that behind. They sacrificed that for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The question is, what have you really sacrificed? Ask yourself, what do you sacrifice to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What, you think that you get $5 or $10 or $20 out of your check, that you, or you don't even do that? That we're sacrificing for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Wallahi, if we don't establish this deen, the next generation will have to come and fix the things that we messed up. Maybe they'll make dua against us, but know that if Allah is with wants this deen to be supreme, he doesn't need any single one of us. There will be a next group of people who come and they will establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without our help. Or we can be from amongst those who take it by the horns and we say we, we are favored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has put us in a position to be able to help establish his deen. You go over to certain countries and you say, hey, I want to give something to the masjid. They, they won't accept it from you. They don't want anything from you. You, you miss that opportunity. There's several massages, subhanAllah. You look at it, the message of the Prophet, there are people in their grave right now who are reaping the reward for everybody who prays in that message. They've been dead for 1,400 years. But they're reaping the reward. They're still getting rewarded in their grave today because they helped to support the message. And here we are with an opportunity at several places in the city, but especially here, to support the house of Allah. Brothers and sisters, let me, let me just say this. Especially for those of you who come from Muslim families, many of you can look back, you can trace back, and you can see that it was your great-great-grandfather or whoever. Maybe it goes back a thousand years, but you, you see where somebody in your family accepted Islam, and then the rest of the family became a Muslim family. Some of you here right now, you have great-grandchildren who are Muslim. You may have accepted this family. Your great-grandchildren will look back and they'll say, that's when our family became a Muslim family. Well, alhamdulillah. Do we want to be those people? Do we want to be those people who because we don't establish the Islamic institutions that need to be established, that somebody down the line your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren look back and say, that's when we became kuffar. Because that's what's going to happen if we don't establish the deen of Allah. That's what's going to happen if we don't take responsibility, personal responsibility, every single one of us. Don't look to the next brother who might be a doctor or an engineer or a great businessman, and he's got all this money in the bank, and you just expect that he's going to be the one to establish the house of Allah. No, Allah hasn't just gave you that opportunity. Are we going to help establish the deen of Allah as a Or are we going to let it slip through our hands? Are we going to let the opportunity slip through our hands? Our Prophet Ali said, From them, 
Take advantage of five before five. Take advantage of your wealth. Doesn't mean that you have a whole lot. It means you have something. Take advantage of your wealth before your poverty. You only know what before the Lord. Take advantage of your wealth before your poverty. Take advantage of your وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بعثه الله رحمة للعالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد brothers and sisters in Islam most of us in here have either have either chosen to be Muslim that is we have accepted Islam or or we have come from another country where we have cultural ties to Islam and so therefore we think that we're always going to be Muslim. Everybody in my family is always going to be Muslim. The reality is that you might consider yourself to be Liberian or Nigerian or whatever else, but your children call themselves Americans, and you know it. Your children, they don't have those same cultural ties. They don't have that thing that binds them to Islam culturally. And therefore, they have to get Islam the way that the rest of us got it. They have to learn about it, and they have to be convinced about it. And where is that going to happen if it doesn't happen in the house of Allah? If we don't support and maintain the houses of Allah. Many of us hear this ayah. I want us to ponder over that. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Man dalladi yuqridu Allah qabdan hasana, fa yudaifahu lahu adhaafan kathira." Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Who is it that will give Allah a loan that is hasan? You're going to loan some money to Allah. Let that sink in for a second." Who's going to give to Allah Azza wa Jal a good loan? So that Allah, Allah says, فَيُضَاعِفَهُ لَهُ So that Allah will increase it and multiply it for him multiple times over. I'm going to come back to that ayah. Listen again, multiply many times over. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنان في كل سنبلة مئة حبة والله يضاعف لما يشاء. Allah Azza wa Jalla says that those who spend in His cause are like a grain. That grain has seven stalks or ears, and each one of them gives off another hundred grains. And seven hundred times over, والله يضاعف لما يشاء. And Allah will increase for whomsoever he wills. Wallahu wasi'un ali. And Allah is all encompassing, all knowledgeable. Now go back to this thing. Who is it that will give Allah a good we know? You see, when we invest in this deen, it's not a low risk investment. A lot of us look for those type of things. Low risk investment, something I can put my money in and doesn't have a lot of, no, this is a no risk investment. When you give to Allah, when you give to the causes that aid this deen, it is multiplied headsmen without any doubt. It's multiplied by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the Salaf used to say, I love it when I find a poor man who will accept my charity because he transfers my money from me to the hereafter. We all, you know, we use different ways. I got to pay this brother as a cash app. Venmo, Zelle, all these other new things that because we got to move money from place to place. How do you move your money to the hereafter? The Prophet said, Yes, but I'll make it to that. There are three that are going to follow that dead person. Three things. For your dear Uthnani, where your power? Two of them are going to go back, and one of them is going to stay with him. Your dear Ahlu, who am I? His family and his wealth are going to go back. Where your power? I'm in and his actions stay with him. In other words, you can, you can die a big
billionaire is not going with you. It's not, it's not happening. It's only one way to transfer the billions that you have in this life, the millions, the hundreds, or whatever you have. It's only one way to transfer it to the hereafter, and that's to give it for the sake of Allah. That's it. But Allah Azawajal said what? He called it, who's going to loan me a goodly loan? But Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says something profound here. He says something profound. He says, if somebody was to come to you, and that person, you know them to be a muhsin, you know them to be somebody who is kind, benevolent, a person who does good. Wafiyun mali. The person always fulfills his obligations, and he has. Yeah, he has the means to fulfill his obligations. But he needs a loan from you. You'll loan him the money. Because you know you're going to get it back, inshallah. As long as you have it. He says, so what about somebody who comes along and they're asking you to loan them money, but they're actually going to do business. You know them to be a great business person. They're going to do business with that money, and they're going to share the profits. You're even more likely, more willing to do what? To loan them that money. They need it. He says, well, what about one who is not only kind and benevolent and generous and who has and who will give you back in kind. In other words, he'll give you back what you loaned and even more and will give you that which you cannot even expect and not even imagine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will you loan him? He says, because if you don't, the person who turns away from that type of loan, he says, he doesn't turn away illa li afatin fi nafsi min al bukhdi wa shuhr except that he has some type of personal defect, a personality defect. He's miserly, he's stingy, which is a terrible quality for a Muslim, by the way. He says, so it's either because he's miserly and he's stingy, or he doesn't really have confidence in the guarantee. Allah is guaranteeing you or you don't have confidence in that guarantee. He said and that is only because that person has low Iman. He has deficient Iman. When Allah calls you to loan him a goodly loan, it's, and you don't, it's deficient. Deficiency in Iman. He says, And that is why the Prophet describes sadaqah as being a burhan, as being a proof. It is a proof that you are a true believer. Brothers and sisters in Islam, this message, message of Allah, Allah has blessed to expand. Allah has blessed them to purchase buildings, to grow. The weekend school that they have, alhamdulillah, anybody who comes here on the weekend, it will make you cry to see the youth learning the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learning their deen. They have purchased other properties that they need to renovate for sisters' activities, for an Islamic daycare, to establish and expand the weekend school and their after school programs. Allah, we don't have an option except that we give to help establish this institution. You see where the money goes. This is not one of those situations where somebody's taking the money and putting it in their pockets. And we have that obligation. There's 500 people here right now. If everybody gave $30, that's $15,000. And alhamdulillah, we'd be close to the goal that we have for this month so that we can finish these projects. And if you don't have $30 to give, hopefully you have more. Look to the person, as they tell you in law school, look to the right and look to the left. That person won't be here by next year. Look to your right and look to the left and assume that that person doesn't have $30 to give, so give 40. So that's 90, round it up to 100, make it easy. But give, when the call is made after Salah, give to support this masjid, give to support the next generation of Muslims so that they will make dua for you the way that we make dua for those who preceded us. As we always say, and as Allah has encouraged us to say in the Quran, 
ربنا اغفر لنا ولاخواننا الذين سبقونا بالايمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين امنوا ربنا انك رؤوف رحيم اللهم اصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة امرنا واصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا اخرتنا التي لا معادنا واجعل الحياه زياده لنا في كل خير والموت راحه لنا من كل شر ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزل قلوبنا بعد هديتنا وهب لنا لدوك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاد Oh Allah, we ask you to make our hearts firm on this deen and we ask you to make us from the salihin wa akhim salam